Okay, hi everybody. Today we have with us Mr. Manu Pillai, no, or, as, or as the Malus say, Morne Pillai. Manu Morne. <laughs> Manu Morne. So Manu is the author of a book called Ivory Throne that I have gushed about in a previous video, and he has written another book called Rebel Sultans, which does not come with the yellow post-its. That was me. <laughs> Congrats, Manu. She's a she's a good reader. She's you know made the effort to mark Diligent. up pages. Diligent. I'm very impressed. Ten out ten out ten. Thank you. This means everything to me. So Manu is an author, obviously. I'm sure he's many other things, but I don't know if anyone really cares about no, that right no, now. No, it's fine. So, so question one. Now, when I talk to like actors and writers and like playwrights, it takes a really long time for a for a thought or an idea to become a book. So was this like? Just a one day spark of an idea. Was it market research? Was it emotional blackmail? How did this happen? No one's done this before, or was yeah, it? Yeah, because you know the, the the topic of the book is the Deccan, which is a region that normally gets the short end of the stick, because we have this tendency a in India to look at history from a North Indian perspective. Everything is the North and the rest. So it's like oh the Mughals, whatever, and then oh yeah, by the way there was Vijayanagar in the south. By the way there were the Cholas in the south. If you actually remove the northern focus and look, say, at the peninsula uh, by itself, you discover that you know they had actually a, a, a rather glamorous history of their own. They had networks across seas. You know, they they had they had all sorts of commercial uh, relationships with with countries and kingdoms around the world and so on. And that's a completely different uh, universe, which we don't necessarily get in a Delhi-centric perspective. So, first book was about Kerala and this last female Maharaja of Kerala. Which was again a forgotten story, and my intention was to resurrect it. This again is a, a, a the Deccan is a neglected region, and when the Deccan does appear at all, it's normally as the place where Shivaji and the Mughals feuded and had this epic battle. But the Deccan was more than that. It yeah. was more than the feud between the Marathas and the Mughals. Yeah. It had thousands of Africans who came and helped shape it. It had African queens in what are now provincial cities like Ahmednagar. Uh, it had Persians. It had Arabs. You know. Uh, the normal image of Vijayanagar, where they say Hindu Empire. Well, in the Hindu Empire, Krishna Devaraya wore Persian-style hats. Their fashion sense was derived from countries in the West. They had eunuchs who came in, uh, culturally speaking, from you know Islamic courts. The so the rulers of Vijayanagar actually called themselves Hindu Sultans. They actually appropriated the title of Sultan. These are rich details which you don't necessarily get in your everyday textbooks. So again, this was an effort, especially in this climate where history is so politicized, it's so um, black and white. You know, Hindu versus Muslim. It's reduced to these uh, very binary uh, boxes. And my whole effort is to say, pause, hold on. History is actually much richer, and it's actually far more fascinating yeah. than we realize. It's not a boring matter of dates and battles. It's actually something. That that can really, really, if we, if we read it in the right perspective, and we, if we read the right books, such as mine, uh, you discover that history is an, a remarkable sort of space. Where someone recently asked me, "Why don't you write fiction?" And I said, "Well, I began with fiction when I was in my teens, but then I started reading these books of history, and I discovered that actually, in our past, there are things that even the most inventive mind." Would hesitate to create for fiction. It's just unbelievable the kind of stories there are. Yeah, for sure. And which is a great segue into my next question. Slash, I'm going to read excerpts from this book. So there's one line which I loved. It's on page 33. So you don't even have to hit page 50 to like enjoy this book. 33 is also auspicious number. So wow, I, I did not know this. In some parts of the culture, to be there for sure. Every governor he sent to the Deccan was a little too readily tempted to rebel. And it wasn't always possible to make an example of each man by throwing parts of him into biryani. That's because there was a certain king and sultan in the north who threw a certain rebellious nobleman into biryani. Yeah, see, and, and tried like, to feed him to his own wife. To be skinned alive, and as his skin was torn off, his flesh was cooked with rice. See, these are the things that they leave out of history textbooks when you're a kid. I mean, granted, some of it's a little graphic, hmm. but it may also be wildly exaggerated. I mean, yeah, obviously there were gruesome punishments, but these stories exist. And, yeah. yeah. Speaking of more non like inappropriate things for children to be <laughs> reading, um, he was more than engrossed in other pursuits such as authoring a book of erotica in which thirty-two stanzas are devoted to the art of oral sex. Because you know this is what this is this particular moment is when a general of the Vijayanagar Emperor comes back you know after a battle 
and discovers that while the kingdom is falling to bits and pieces around the king, the king is busy in his artistic pursuits. I actually Chilling. admire him for in the in the in the you know in that. 500 or 400 years ago yeah. for sitting and you know investing this kind of energy in discovering 32 ways to have oral sex so Where he can deserves a certain amount of credit but that will be complicated because we've become a very prudish uh, society so uh, we like exactly. to pretend that you know we all just sort of were born out of immaculate yeah, you know good, conceptions good. rather than anything to do with so next resurrection huh, project <laughs> so my question actually about this was you know when when you talk about history and like being a historian you as you said you have to maintain the serious image so what prompted you to sort of put together or like include these like small tidbits about the craziness of these people because you know the, we have this conception of the past as some sort of alien country yeah whereas my whole effort is don't tell history through battles and events don't tell, tell it through things that feel alien so example if I, if someone says oh 500 elephants arrayed on the battlefield but yeah. nobody's seen 500 elephants today uh, yeah. in bangalore where have you seen 500 elephants arrayed on the battlefield so we may not necessarily connect instantly to it but if you tell history through people and to people's reactions to their context you discover that while the context is not the same as ours basic core human impulses reactions behaviors are the same yeah people in history were not different from us that's often a mistake we make thinking that they were either villains or they were great you know good kings no they had all the flaws and prejudices and weaknesses that we had they had sex they had their own uh, flaws <laughs> they had they had challenges that they tried to negotiate what we can learn is how they dealt with the past how they dealt with things in their own time and we can learn from it yeah. but the reason i include these slightly reverential details is also because a they exist and i don't want to whitewash history into some sort of uh, you know sophisticated uh, pretentious uh, yeah. version no that's not that's not the point and the point is also to remind people that they were just like you and me they had the same thoughts they had the same inclinations and you know hello if you look at history that way you become part of the story much sooner because you're actually connecting with that historical figure yeah. you may not connect with this time you may not connect with the battles around him as such yeah. but you can connect with that historical figure and that makes history interesting yeah i mean i'm sure we've all had thoughts about skinning someone alive and putting them into biryani and then feeding their flesh yeah. to their family just yesterday but so it's nice to you know relate that we're not Obviously. the only ones and i think this is also true of like the classics even though they're fiction like something that was like tolstoy wrote in russia how many ever years ago is still relatable because, because of human people, relationships correct those those, those basic patterns don't change. Okay so history is obviously like a slippery slope because you can start somewhere and end somewhere else and you know there's the whole world that you can cover. So I know you mentioned that this was one of the sort of lost stories that you wanted us to direct but how did you pick the time period because I'm sure you can go before and after. You can but the so the book is called Rebel Sultans the Deccan from Khilji to Shivaji. Now these are two very important moments in the larger history of the Deccan. Khilji introduces for the first time a the religion of islam b new cavalry technologies and, and warfare and so on a new conception of power itself khilji's arrival marks the opening of a phase when south indian history changed in a completely new way and it it, it turned onto a completely new path so khilji is essential as a good beginning point because it, it it's a new, it's a new chapter that emerges and shivaji is where i end partly because there are 100 books on shivaji and shivaji has been studied by far better scholars so why do i want to contribute again to something that's already been done well but shivaji is where i end the final closing note of the book is with shivaji because he again marks the next phase of the history of the deccan where he comes up with a new vision a new conception of power and so on so i thought the span in the middle was a fascinating time because what you see in the deccan is this fascinating intermixture of religion of people i mean you you have characters a maharashtrian kid sitting say in pune where i grew up does not realize that till the 16th century the the local region's history was the, the local history was shaped to a great extent by thousands of africans nobody has any memory of the fact that africans came to the deccan by the thousand achieved great heights of power and remember this african warlord had a daughter who he got married to the sultan of ahmednagar and the sultan so you have you have this situation where the sultan of ahmednagar is descended partly from persian brides and from a brahmin who converted to islam he now marries the daughter of a black man born into slavery in africa and this is ahmednagar in the early 17th century and you're like kids don't learn this kids don't dis- realize that when you talk about the history of maharashtra it's not merely a hindu history or a muslim history there are persians africans brahmin converts there are muslim kings who are interested in advaita philosophy there's this constant dialogue between religions and this 
black and white thing of history is what I want to break. What I want to sort of the reason I want to highlight these stories is to put an end to that and say it's actually far more complex. History is like this. It's not. It's not black or white. It's a tapestry of many colors in which different people have woven different threads, including so a Malikamba, oh. <laughs> including a Malikamba, or including other character was this guy called Yusuf Adil Shah. Yusuf was born somewhere in Persia. Gets on a ship to come to De- through the Deccan and become a warrior. On the way, he decides I'm going to concoct a genealogy for myself and claim I'm the long lost son of the Ottoman Emperor. Gets here, Just becomes a, yeah, yeah, because people do this. Yeah. You know, immigrants from India who went to the Trinidad and those islands in the in in America. Uh, often they also became ship Brahmins, as they were called. You know, on the ship they claim they were of higher caste. So anyway, Yusuf comes here, claims he's royal, uh, has a political marriage after he becomes fairly influential with the daughter of a Maratha king, of a Maratha general. Sorry. So you have this Persian marrying into a Maratha family, and he spawns what's called the Adil Shahi dynasty. So you have some Adil Shahs who are completely besotted with the Persian side of their family. So they, you know, they drilling their soldiers in Persian uniform. They speak in Persian only, and so on. Then you have someone like Ibrahim Adil Shah the second, who is completely besotted with the Marathi side of his family. He speaks only Marathi so much so that when the Mughals send an ambassador, Persian is the language of diplomacy, and they discover that the Adil Shah only wants to speak Marathi. His favorite, uh, you know, the lady he was completely in love with was this Maharashtrian dancer called Ramba. He called himself. He was a Shia, a Sunni Muslim, but he called himself the son of Guru Ganapati and Saraswati. Yeah. And when he died, there was such confusion about whether he was an apostate, whether he was really a Muslim or not, whether he had become a Hindu. That the epitaph basically says, "No, Ibrahim was not a Muslim, not a Hindu, not a Jew, not a Christian. He was actually genuinely a Muslim." Because this man sort of encapsulated and sort of condensed the best of all religions, and he became something of an Akbar of the Deccan. You know, he was interested in these concepts. So you find that a Muslim king like Ibrahim is not more than just that one identity. He wasn't merely in this box that you mark as Muslim and put on the side. Say, yeah. okay, he equal to bad Muslim king. Yeah. Actually, no, he was interested in far more. It wasn't. Some sort of communal thing where all the Hindus were masked on one side and all the Muslims on the other, and they were all like killing each other and waiting to sort of pounce at each other's throats. It was actually a little more complicated. There were the rotten eggs of history. There were the people who people who justified various political ambitions in the name of religion, but there were also, in equal measure, others who had set a completely different standard. And I, my whole point in the book is that in the twenty first century, it's for us to decide: Do you want to? Like stew in resentments because there were some rotten eggs five hundred years earlier, or do you want to draw wisdom from the people who actually created something new all that time ago, who were able to rise above the violence of their age, create a new vision, and do you want to in- find inspiration in their stories and help shape a better future for our times? Yeah, for sure. So lots of takeaways from that. Firstly, you now have ammunition if your parents are like, we cannot marry this person because they are from different community. Just be like. Read this, Correct. learn our history, and yeah. realize that these were the greatest people of their time, and they did it. So why not us? We are going now to our rapid fire round oh. because Karan Johar is my inspiration right. in life. <clears throat> are you ready? So we talked about um, Ibrahim Adil Shah, who like wore red nail polish and was just generally a fashionista. Yeah, quite a character. And Rudraksha Malas also. Yeah. And he once this trader came and he he went to meet Ibrahim, and Ibrahim was sort of sitting there surrounded by five hundred bejeweled women playing Venus. And the man just like, picture oh, that. Just yeah. picture I mean, that. Picture a, a man in Persianized costume, speaking Marathi, thinking in terms of Hindu philosophy, with red nails, yeah. sitting in a court surrounded by five hundred women playing veenas. It would have made the most epic Instagram photo. Speaking of my rapid fire yes, question, sorry. I have been intervened. In <laughs> you are bad at rapid fire. Yeah. Right. If he had an Instagram handle, what would it be? Hmm. This is not going to be very rapid. Oh, wow, that's a very intelligent question. Yeah. Nobody's asked me this before. <laughs> uh, well, son of Saraswati and Ganapati. Well, that's a bit long, but son of Saraswati, I think, is great. Huh. Yeah, okay. son of Saraswati. Son of Saraswati. If it's taken, it'll have underscores. Yeah. Okay. okay, perfect. Cool. If there was a tabloid from any of these uh, regimes that you've mentioned, and there was the headline for it, what would the headline read? What's the news? You pick one, pick anything, and pick if a nice a, clickbaity if, BuzzFeed okay, if, headline. If there was a tabloid in, say, the Bahmani Times, it would be Firoz Shah Bahmani goes to war in Vijayanagar, comes back with Vijayanagar princess and two thousand artists. 
Yeah. That's a very long Actually, headline. yeah, that's not a long. That's not that's not work. Okay, give me another like clickbaity one. Click like a listicle. Click what is a like listicle? Ten things you didn't know about your king. <laughs> Ten things you did. Ha ha ha. That so I want. Yeah, so you want <laughs> ten things you didn't know about the Bahmani Sultan. There you go. This is terrible. I'm very bad. Really bad. Very bad. Please do not. This is not a reflection of the book. The book is a yeah, very book, uh, yeah. It's well thought out. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well thought out. This is not a well thought out uh, part of this interview. There's a dog outside. Huh? So cute. Okay, bring it back. Um, which of these sultans would have thrown the best house party? Ibrahim. Wow, that was a rapid fire. Ibrahim would have. There would have been five hundred sure. Vina ladies to begin with. But there like dubstep been... remix or no dubstep? Both. Remix. You can have both yeah. sides. Like large hall, no? So one yeah. side, one thing, one side. Oh, one multiple side. stages. Yeah. And uh, we would all have had to have nail polish, of course. Yes. And he would even have done a costume party. Would he convinced. be considered like a hashtag fashion influencer? I think he was. By today's standards. Yeah, he was quite yeah. a fashion influencer. He, sure. he was one of the sultans who painted the most. Yeah. So clearly he also had a little bit of Instagram style narcissism. Yeah. But he wanted his face sort of plastered yeah. everywhere. Yeah. Next question. If Chand Bibi had a TED talk, mm-hmm. what would it be about? Hmm. How my how the men around me screwed me over <laughs> and murdered me when I was trying to help them. It would be somewhat like tragic, but that's what they did to her. She was trying to defend Ahmed Nagar and she was doing a very good job of it. And all these men decided that hmm queen too much ambition let us get rid of her. You know her mother was also a ruler in Ahmed Nagar. For 6 years she was in control. And her the men around her got so paranoid by the degree of ambition and ability she had that when her son sort of forcibly took over and but these nobles basically forcibly took over and parked her in jail. she they tried to expunge not only records about her but even miniature paintings in which she was there they tried to sort of paint over her and reduced her to these giant blots in these paintings so these lovely miniature paintings where her husband appears and there are the other characters standing like this and like this and between all this you see this like obscure <laughs> blot and that used to be chandi bibi's mother so it was a time when all these men had a little bit of a problem with strong women are you saying that that time has ended because i don't think so no, i it think hasn't sadly some things as do not change they don't yeah. please learn from marginally history. perhaps but yeah not learn from history dosto yeah please yeah. last question if you had to set me up on a date with one of the sultans who would you pick and why I tempted to say Malik Ambar because uh, I mean he was very interesting, but he would have he was also Tall very devoutly no he was also devout about his Islam. He would have put you in parda maybe, mm. uh, but I think you you would have enjoyed being set up with Firoz Shah Bahmani. Mm. Firoz Shah Bahmani was this man who, as I write in the book, had an empire of wives. Uh, uh, why would I want to be one among an empire? He was a wives. great conversationalist. Okay. <laughs> and he spoke to he collected wives from different parts of the world. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So he spoke to each wife in her own native tongue, and he turned. So, for example, the wife from Arabia was called Arbi Mahal, and she lived in what is called Arbi Mahal. All her servants were Arabs. They only were allowed to speak Arabic. So every time he came there, he would get practice in Arabic. Begum Bangal Club. <laughs> oh God. Joke. Anyway. <laughs> Terrible joke. <laughs> Terrible joke. It's my anyway, signature style. Much. I have one last question. So, oh. so like now that this book is done and there's a void in your life, what's next? Oh, the next book's already happening. What? I, I haven't started writing it. Can I sign you up for this interview again? Sure. Then uh, let's hope nobody throws stones at me after Why some of the things we've said. No, they oh, throw because... stones at me, and I'll have the book huh. to shield <laughs> myself with. Yeah okay. You uh, report and let me know how your experience goes. Okay. In terms of dealing with stone pelters, and then I will come back and okay. we'll do this again in two thousand twenty. Are you allowed to reveal what the next one is about? No, is it a resurrection a... of a grey area? In no, oh, a little bit. Okay. <laughs> again, a little bit because there are so many wonderful areas. Yeah. They need to be resurrected. Did you say wonderful? Yeah, sort of. <laughs> I like it. New word. Jai no. Mata Di. Jai Mata Di. All the best, you know. Manu Mone, Mone Manu. And uh, please, please. Yes, available on Amazon in several bookstores. And this is the bag. This is the bag. This is the whole thing. There is a man on an elephant. And this is actually indicative. The reason we chose this is because, uh, you know, Sultan of Persian and Maratha origins, African supporter at the back. It represents the world of the Deccan very well. An elephant. An elephant, of course. Which is a. Yeah. Elephants are always, Indian always, always yes. welcome. Thank you Manu